Hi there, and welcome back to Hopeful Homeschooling. Today we're going to be talking about learning styles and how knowing your kids well can help you teach them more effectively. And we'll also be going into a little bit more detail on each subject that you're required to teach here in Maryland and how you can teach multiple ages at the same time um, to help you save your sanity and still teach your kids effectively. So let's dive right in. Hopefully you've had a chance to observe your kids and see what they enjoy doing with their free time. As I mentioned last episode, um, that can kind of give us some clues as to how they might um, learn the best. And so there are a couple disclaimers I want to throw out there before we talk about the learning styles. The first one is that um, I fully acknowledge that a kid can have a hobby that doesn't necessarily reflect their learning style. And I think that goes without saying, but I just wanted to clarify that a child can really love Um, listening to music, listening to podcasts, but they may be a visual learner and um, listening to something is just a form of entertainment for them. Um, And the same could go with other learning styles too and how kids might enjoy one thing, but learn the best a different way. Um, The second thing I wanted to point out is that you don't have to present every single subject you teach to your child in their learning style. Um, When you think about it, it's really not real life. Um, If your child goes on to go to college or if they, you know, hopefully get a job at some point um, when they're grown, uh, they're not going to have everyone catering to their learning styles. And so it's important to have these discussions with your kids as they get older. You can kind of teach them how they learn best. Um, But I would just encourage you to really focus in on the learning styles um, that you know your kids have, especially when they're struggling with a subject. Um, So hopefully that'll make more sense as we continue on to talk about the different learning styles. So let's talk about the three main learning styles. The first one we'll discuss is the auditory learning style. And these are the kids who learn best and retain the most information when they are able to hear it. And so if you think about the internet and YouTube, there are videos and information set to songs and chants everywhere, right? If you want to learn the president of the United States, or the 50 states, or the water cycle, or um, days of the week. There can be um, videos and songs found lots of different places on the web. And so the hard work has already been done for you. It's just a matter of repetition and letting your learners hear those songs repeatedly. And hopefully they'll kind of latch onto it and really enjoy learning that way. Um, So that could be one way that you could find those um, resources. You could also have a child make up their own chant or song um, to learn the information, depending on the subject. Um, With reading, it's helpful to have students read aloud to themselves, and this is one place where homeschooling really has an advantage over traditional schooling. Um, In a class size of 20 plus kids, it's just not feasible to let every child who's an auditory learner and needs to hear themselves read do that um, because it becomes so much of a distraction and it's just too much. But when you're homeschooling, you can assign your child some pages to read. You can send them off to their room. They can read aloud. They don't even have to whisper. They can just read at a normal volume. And all the while they're reading it, they're retaining more. Then when they're finished, you could call them back to you. You could have them narrate to you what they read. And narration is just a fancy word of um, summarizing, a fancy word for summarizing uh, what they've learned. And so they, again, when they're telling you what they've learned, um, they're hearing the information again. And again, that, that's helping them to retain it. Um, And then for a subject like spelling, the say, spell, say method would probably work well for auditory learners. So if the spelling word is cat, you can have them say cat, C-A-T, cat. And you can have them repeat this as often as necessary. But again, hearing the letters and the spelling versus seeing it um, will help them retain retain it better. Um, The next type of learning style is visual learning. And these are the kids who learn best by seeing information. They might enjoy reading independently, maybe writing stories. Um, They're the ones who have a photographic memory. So once they see something, they can maybe remember where they read it on a page uh, if they were asked to recall it. Um, So let's talk about the application of this a little bit. If you were to walk into a traditional school, a brick and mortar building, um, it's usually highly catered to visual learners. Um, It's easy to put posters on a wall, 
charts with information. You have, you know, a dry erase board, um, a chalkboard, or most likely a smart board, something like that, to where a teacher can write information down and, and students can see it. Um, so you can still do this at home too. You can put posters up around your school space that will engage the visual learners and help them with their learning. Um, so yeah, charts can cover parts of speech, math, fact families, diagrams of say body systems, if you're working on that in science or health. Um, in math, you could practice with flashcards. That's helpful to visual learners because again, they can see the facts, the answers, they can close their eyes and recall it. You could have them write their own flashcards. And again, that's another piece of the visual learning um, is them being able to write it too. And then for spelling words, for visual learners, it could be as simple as studying a list or writing the words, tracing the words if they're younger. Um, you can make it fun, have them write with colored pencils or write with highlighters because it's homeschool. You don't have to always write in pencil, right? Um, and so those would be some, just a couple of tips to help visual learners retain their information. And then the last is the kinesthetic learners. These are the kids who love to move their bodies as much as possible. It's hard for them to sit still. For the kinesthetic learners, we want to let them have as many opportunities as possible to engage their bodies during learning. And it might take a little creativity on your part. This is not a, a learning style that I feel is quite as um, commonly catered to in traditional schooling. But again, in homeschooling, you have a lot more freedom. Um, and so one of the ways that you would want to help kinesthetic learners is to use manipulatives and just concrete objects whenever possible. Um, so for example, in our math program, I have a child who is a heavily kinesthetic learner and he loves to touch, feel, move, wiggle, all the things. So we use a program called Math UC and it has these blocks. This is uh, representing the hundreds and these are the tens and these are the ones. So it helps him to be able to hold these blocks in his hand, to see them, to feel them, to be able to understand the connections. It helps with place value um, and ideas like that. For telling time, you know, we have an actual um, kid's clock where he can move the hands instead of just a picture of a clock that's showing the times, right? Um, for language arts and reading and spelling, I use a program called All About Spelling and All About Reading. They have these little uh, magnetic tiles with the letters on them. The consonants are in blue and the vowels are in red. And so that kind of helps him with um, being able to put words together when we're spelling. And also, I just got these, haven't used them yet, but this is the same idea as the tiles. I'll show you here. Um, these are blocks that have the letters on them that actually connect together. So I think that he'll really enjoy doing that with spelling um, spelling words. Um, also in math, you could let them engage their bodies by maybe if you're working on, I'd say division or subtraction facts, um, any, any process that's making a number smaller, you could have them maybe clap their answer. So for example, if you're asking them, uh, what is 25 divided by five, they could clap five times instead of um, saying the number five. So you won't always have time to do these types of activities every day, but the, the times when you can for your kinesthetic learners, I think will really benefit them. Um, you could have them do jumping jacks or, you know, I did this with um, one of my children when they were learning the ABCs. They just jumped for every letter um, because it helped them moving their body. And for spelling, you could use uh, the little rubber stamps and ink pads. If you have the alphabet stamps, they could stamp their sight words or their spelling words um, in Play-Doh or in ink, really. Um, if you're really feeling brave, you could do, you know, put out some shaving cream, let them use their finger to write the letters out in shaving cream, or you could do the same um, with other materials like sand or a salt tray, something like that. Um, so again, just that... Um, body connection helps the kinesthetic learners. So that's just a quick overview of the main learning styles. I hope I was able to give you just a, a general idea of how um, learners can learn differently and how you can kind of help them when you're teaching different subjects. Now let's talk about the subjects that you're required to teach in Maryland. Before we get into the details, 
Just a word about choosing curriculum. We'll be talking a lot more about curriculum in future videos, but I wanted to give you two really good resources to start with so that you can just kind of familiarize yourself with um, some curriculum choices that you have. So the first is kathyduffyreviews.com. This is an awesome resource. Um, you can basically search by subject, by grade, and it's basically a really long list of curriculum choices with summaries and links to the publisher's website. And she also has a print book if you refer it. Again, her name is Kathy Duffy. Um, the second is Rainbow Resource, and it's just a huge curriculum distributor. Um, again, you can search curriculum by subject and by grade. Um, they have samples that you can download so that you can really see um, examples of what you're wanting to buy. And then I think they also offer free shipping over a certain amount of money. I think it might be $75, but that goes quickly when you're buying curriculum, especially for more than one child. Um, I've also heard that you can call Rainbow Resource and speak to the people who work there and kind of get like a personalized recommendation from them about what might suit your family's needs after talking to you for a little bit. So um, I think that would be an, another great place to start. So let's start with English. Um, English encompasses all the language arts. So that's phonics and reading, um, reading comprehension, spelling, grammar, um, writing, meaning handwriting and composition. It encompasses a lot of different um, subjects. And so it's not an easy area um, to teach with multiple grades for obvious reasons. If you have a kindergartner who's learning phonics and just the beginning of reading, and then you have a fourth or fifth grader who's probably reading pretty fluently, um, that's hard to combine. And so um, what I would suggest for English is to use one of the sites that I mentioned to resource, uh, I'm sorry, to research a few choices um, according to their grade level that they're in at school. And most curriculum choices have uh, placement tests that you can do. Um, there are lots of curriculum that combine reading, writing, grammar, and spelling into one program. That way you're not buying a book for spelling and a book for reading and a book for writing and composition. Um, yeah, there are curriculum that combine those all together. Uh, some of the examples of curriculum are Sunlight and The Good and the Beautiful. Those those both come from a Christian or a religious um, perspective. And then a couple secular curriculums that do the same are Brave Writer and First Language Lesson. So they might be a, a couple of good places for you to start your search um, and then just kind of go from there. So math is the other subject that does not... Um, is not easy to teach multiple ages, again, for the similar reasons as uh, uh, English. So I would suggest the same thing to start researching curriculum based on grade level. Now, something that's important to address here, at least in Maryland, is the whole Common Core situation. Um, I don't know a lot about Common Core because we've been homeschooling, but I know that if you were to look for a homeschool curriculum that would perfectly match up with what your child has been doing in public schools, I don't think it's out there. And so if you're a person who is absolutely sure that if you homeschool, it will only be for one year, the best thing for you might be to call your child's school um, and to just ask them what kind of curriculum they would use for the grade that your child would be in next year. And then it might be possible to find that curriculum, a, a teacher's guide and a child textbook, and you can go for it and try and, and see if that will work for you. Um, otherwise, I would do the grade level placement test and I wouldn't get hung up if you if your child's in third grade and they place in a level two curriculum, I wouldn't get too upset about that because again, homeschooling curriculum is so different from public school curriculum. Um, if you are determined that your child should be doing level three when they're in grade three and you're trying to force it, um, it may not end well. Um, it might be a, a situation where everybody's frustrated. So it might be best if you just went with the curriculum suggestion, even if it doesn't match up with the grade level that your child's in. Um, what matters is that they're learning the material. So a couple different cur math curriculum choices I wanted to talk about were um, there are some that are online. Uh, teaching textbooks is one that I've used. It does start in third grade, um, but it's a secular math curriculum and um, it's everything's online. 
So that might appeal to you as like one less thing that you have to teach or at least be super involved with. Um, math, you see, is the one I was talking about with the, the blocks. Um, that's a DVD-based lesson. So uh, the teacher teaches the lesson on the DVD and then your child completes the workbook pages for the week. Um, Saxon is another popular math curriculum in the homeschool world. Um, and then one that's a little bit different is it's called Math Lessons for a Living Education, and it's published by Masterbooks. And this one is a little bit unique because it's story-based. So in the beginning of the week, there's one story, and then the rest of the lessons from the week correspond to that story. And so I found that to be a pretty gentle math curriculum. It's not very rigorous. Um, but it, it would probably be a good fit for homeschooling families who are new uh, or who, who just pulled their kids out of public school to kind of start with. Um, so in my opinion, English and math are really the only grades that need to be taught completely separately based on age or grade. So now let's talk about something called the morning basket and how it can simplify your life a little bit. So morning basket or morning time was a phrase originally coined by a homeschool mom named Cindy Rollins. She uh, homeschooled in the 80s and 90s. She had nine kids. I think it was eight boys and one girl. So if you can imagine, she would have never had time to pull each child aside and instruct them in all the different subjects individually. There wouldn't be enough hours in the day. Um, so she began teaching them all at once. And I think she says in her book that she um, started with just a read aloud and from there kind of built on subjects and found that it worked really well to do this family style learning. Um, so she would do subjects like poetry and history and art um, and then she would kind of customize their application based on the ages of the children. So let's talk about like what this would look like in real life. Um, so social studies is one of the subjects you're required to teach in Maryland. Social studies is kind of a broad subject, right? It could be geography, it could be American history, it could be world history, it could be ancient civilizations or civic and governments. There's a wide range of topics that you um, could use in social studies based on your kids' ages. Um, there are several curriculum choices that have um, it's kind of the same idea as Cindy Rollins, just a read aloud and then different worksheets or different activities that um, are appropriate for different ages. Um, or, yeah. So, uh, some curriculum choices that I'll throw out there for this time would be Story of the World, that's a secular one, The Good and the Beautiful, that's religious, uh, The Mystery of History, that's religious, and Sunlight is religious as well. And so again, it's the idea of all sitting down together at the table and hearing a CD or hearing you as the mom reading a lesson about history to your kids. And I'll say this too about reading aloud. Um, if you don't, if you've never heard of Sarah McKenzie, you should really look her up. She has an awesome podcast called uh, The Read Aloud Revival. And she has taught me a lot about um, reading aloud to kids and how especially in the younger ages, but the older ones too, how it's good to have their hands busy while they're listening. So if you're thinking to yourself, my kids would never sit still at a table for an hour while I read to them. Um, it doesn't have to be like that, right? It doesn't even have to be at a table. But if you were to give your kids Play-Doh, just a ball of Play-Doh, you don't even have to drag out like all the tools. My kids want to pull out all the tools every time. Um, but if they just have something in their hands to kind of work with and mold, um, they're still listening, right? They could color. Um, or I don't know, doing something else with their hands is fine. Snacks are always good. I mean, let's be real. Kids love to eat. So, um, those are some ideas that you can keep in mind when you're thinking about reading aloud to a group for a while. Um, so yes, that's, that's what I wanted to say about social studies, science and health. Again, these are broad topics. Um, science can encompass so many different things and sometimes science and health overlap. Like if you're studying the body systems, um, anatomy, right? That would be science and health. Um, but if you're talking about just health, there aren't too many curriculum choices that I've come across that um, would be uh, multi-level. Um, but you can cover topics that you choose. You could do nutrition or safety or good habits. That could be considered health. Um, but unit studies are good for science and health, I've found, because 
you can, again, read material aloud to the students and then personalize it for their ages or their grade range. Um, so let's say you're doing a unit study on nutrition, right? If you're talking about the food pyramid, um, one thing that you could do would be after you're teaching it, um, you could have, if you have like preschoolers, they could use play food and they could sort their play food into the different food groups, the whole grains here and the proteins here and the dairy here and so on and so forth. Um, and then your middle elementary guys could maybe draw pictures of different types of those food groups, or they could look in magazines and cut them out or, um, something like that to make like a balanced meal. Right. And then middle schoolers, high schoolers, you can start to apply it in terms of, okay, you plan a menu, a well-balanced breakfast, a well-balanced lunch, and a well-balanced dinner based on what we learned about the food pyramid. And then you can actually teach them how to cook these things, right. If they don't know. And so that's just one example of how you can take a unit study or one, um, subject and customize it for younger, middle, and upper grades. Um, so some curricular curriculum choices that take a similar approach to one topic and um, customizing it would be apologia. That's a Christian um, perspective. The good and the beautiful, again, that's religious and sunlight. That's Christian as well. You could also... Um, do nature journaling and you could pick an aspect of nature and dig really deep into that and you don't even need a specific curriculum for that you could just find some field guides on amazon like a bird like a bird book of birds of um, north america or birds of maryland if you want to be more specific and um you know bird watch you could have kids sketch the birds you can listen to what the birds sound like um you know, you could do the same with trees or flowers, um, and then just go as deep as you can. And again, that's going to be something that all grades can do. They can all sketch what they see out in nature. Um, uh, one curriculum uh, that could direct you a little bit in that is called Exploring Nature with Children. And then um, just another secular um, science unit study curriculum is called Elemental Science. Now let's talk about art. Art, again, is um, a broad subject. You can approach art any way that you want, and you don't have to even buy a curriculum. Between library books and the internet, there is so much information that you could find and use to teach art. You could easily choose an artist and study his or her life and their works. You could practice the techniques they were best known for. You could try to recreate one of their masterpieces. Again, you can do this with all grades. Um, all grades can listen while you're teaching and they can all try their best to do um, these projects. You could also find some how to draw books and give each child the same book or the same copy of each page to try on their own. You could do YouTube tutorials um, that use different mediums. You could do ones that draw certain characters. You could probably find some um, chalk pastel tutorials. Um, you could look on Pinterest for seasonal ideas for art projects. Um, there is no one telling you specifically what you have to teach for art. You can make it fun for yourself and fun for your kids, and it doesn't even have to be interconnected or aligned with your other subjects. Um, just have fun with it. So similar to that is music. You can choose any classical composer that you like. Um, you could learn about their life and listen to their works, and um, you could deep dive into different genres of music. So if you wanted to learn about jazz and the period of history when jazz came to be and learn about the instruments that the jazz uh, musicians play, you can research those and you could, um, could listen to that music and you can try to find worksheets. But again, I don't think you have to, to have evidence of all the things you do. Just take notes of what you did on what day, if it was a YouTube video, right, what it was. Um, just so that when it comes for review time, you can be able to say, you know, this is what we did. Um, but yeah, just reading books and watching videos and immersing yourself in a type of music, it all counts. Um, so also if your child is taking music lessons or voice lessons, or they're singing in a church choir, they count for music too. Um, if you're Christians, you can learn the hymns and deep dive into the lives of um, the, the people who wrote the hymns and the stories behind them. Um, so there are a lot of different approaches you can take with music as well. 
And the last subject is gym, so, or physical education. So organized sports definitely count. We don't know what fall will look like in terms of, will there be recreational soccer leagues or um, what, but if your child is doing that or they're doing karate or they're taking swimming lessons, um, that counts as gym. I mean, I've always found it to be sufficient um, for that. And some places offer homeschool classes during the day. Um, gymnastics classes, um, they have gymnastics classes for homeschoolers and swim lessons again during the middle of the day. Um, Climb Zone and Urban Air are two local businesses that even have, I think, homeschool um, hours, certain hours. And Climb Zone has like this whole program, I think, that would also count toward gym. Um, and there are organizations that have gym classes speci specifically for homeschoolers. Um, whether through co-ops or I know locally Beachmont Christian Camp has, um, they do homeschool gym. And I, if you check your local parks and recreation pages, um, there may be some homeschool programs listed there as well. Um, so a couple of things to round out this video. Um, remember that just because this is called or referred to as morning basket or morning time, the together learning, um, it doesn't mean that it has to be in the mornings. You have to figure out the rhythm of your family and it can be any time you want. It can be before or after lunch, in the afternoon. It can be in the evening if it needed to be. Um, you rearrange your schedule the way that it works best for your family. Um, but I'll leave you with these resources. So Cindy Rollins was the one who I said kind of invented morning time. She has a book called Mere Motherhood. Can you see it? Um, and this is just a really beautiful, sweet book. It's kind of her memoir, but she also talks a lot about her homeschooling and uh, morning time and what it looked like when she was homeschooling back in the day. And it's kind of, um, there are some funny parts too of trouble that her boys got into. So I'd recommend that. And then she has this uh, book, A Handbook to Morning Time. I bought this uh, a little while ago, but it it's a really helpful resource. The good news is that it's not even on Amazon or anything anymore because I looked it up to see if I could link it um, in this video and she's giving it away for free on her website so I will link her website um, below this video and she just kind of goes through and talks about um, like a framework for morning time and again she does um, a lot of subjects like poetry and Shakespeare things that homeschool families just starting out it may feel overwhelming for um, but it's still just a good kind of a, a spine or a, a good, um, a good place to start for, it's a good place to start for direction in morning time. Uh, and then I would introduce you to my virtual friend, Pam Barnhill. Um, she wrote a book called Better Together and she has a podcast called Your Morning Basket and an awesome website. She has morning time plans that you can purchase that tell you kind of, um, yeah, what to read for certain seasons and things like that. But again, you don't need, you don't need to purchase those, but, um, I would definitely, if I were you look at her site, I would read this book because she does a really good job of ex explaining morning time and outlining it there. Um, and again, the podcast is really good too. So I hope that from this video, you were able to take away some ideas of how to specifically teach these subjects and how you can hopefully combine some subjects so that you're not spreading yourself too thin throughout the day. If you have any questions, let me know. And um, I look forward to our next episode. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, methodologies and uh, curriculum. So I will see you next time. Have a good one.